Father, we thank you that we've been able to come together this morning to sing your praises, for we have much to be thankful for. You have redeemed us and brought us into your family. May we be encouraged this morning and our faith be strengthened as we begin this time of Advent to celebrate the birth of Jesus, our Messiah. We put our trust in you as our state borders are opened. Many will be fearful what will be the outcome as we are exposed to the COVID virus. We pray for our government, particularly for our police force and those who endeavour to keep us safe. We pray for our hard-working medical staff as they battle with overwork that they might be given the strength to cope with work pressures. We particularly pray for Mark and Verity as they face an unknown future as the virus spreads through our community. As we survey our world with not only the devastation that COVID-19 is causing, but power struggles that are causing thousands to flee their homes and seek refuge in neighbouring countries, we pray for wisdom to be given to our world leaders as they grapple with the demands, not only the COVID, but the impact of global warming on our planet. We thank you that you are a God of compassion and mercy and we acknowledge that you are still in control as man ignores and denies your very existence. 
we put our faith in you that whatever the future holds you will continue to care and bless us beyond our expectations thank you father in jesus name amen lastly let she bring the notices Last week, as uh, Mark led the service, he uh, talked about being prepared. How many points did he have? Anyone remember? Five. I can remember there were five points, but I can't remember the five. I've asked Mark, would he make that available if you wanted a copy of, uh, of what Mark had prepared? Uh, it was a mini sermon. I think uh, he's more than happy to give you a copy of that. So um, I was thinking about what he was saying about being prepared, about all the plans they made. And he's made plans for his surgeries and no doubt plans of what will happen if COVID really takes off in, Abdo, in South Australia, particularly in Adelaide. And this morning we found out that there's a, a, a new variant which they're not sure whether even our... Um, our jab is going to help protect us from that. So what's the new plan, Mark? Have you changed your plans? Have it. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine him saying, it's all too hard. Life wasn't meant to be this easy. Uh, and uh, so I was thinking of a poem that was written by a Scottish poet Robert Burns back in 1785 and was uh, titled To a Field Mouse and Robert was ploughing his fields and he went through and ploughed over and destroyed a, a mouse mouse's nest which the mouse had set this thing up all ready for winter a good place to be protected from the weather with some grain around and it all came undone. And there's two key lines in that poem. Does anyone know what they are? The third line. The opening line. Yeah, no, it's well down in the poem. And to say it, in, as the Scotsman would say it, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glee, or in other words, often go astray. And so we can make all sorts of preparations. But because we're not in con total control of situations, we can't guarantee that our plans are going to come to a fruition. You think of all the people that arrange weddings and then cancel them and then arrange them again and then cancel them. And this morning, the whole world is unsure of now what they do about closing their borders and... Uh, South Australia are now, if you go to Western Australia, you're going to have the two weeks quarantine. And the COVID, this new uh, variant, is already in Australia and spreading. So, when I think about it, and I think, well, God has plans. Has God got a plan B? And I know that Mark has. Colin has assured us so many. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> oh, probably and Colin. Uh, assured us that God doesn't have a plan B. He doesn't need to because he is in control. And so when he makes a plan, he knows he can carry it out. And this is confirmed in the scriptures I found in Isaiah in chapter 14 it says the Lord Almighty has sworn surely as I have planned so it will be and as I have purposed so it will stand I will crush the Assyrian in my land on my mountains I will trample him down his yoke will be taken from my people and his burden removed from their shoulders this was his plan this is the plan determined for the whole world 
This is the hand stretched out over all nations. For the Lord Almighty has purpose, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? So we don't have to have fears about the future because God is in control. God has his plan for each one of us. And so we can rely on God and put our hope and trust in him. So we're going to sing another uh, hit, uh, song. It was written back in 1680 uh, by a German composer. And, um, and then it was uh, translated into English in the early 1900s. And the words are old and sometimes a little bit strange, but the sentiments and the truth is still there. And I think this might be one that I've chosen that we're not sure about. Uh, the musicians are not sure about. So if you find difficulty singing with your mask on, just look at the words because they're very important. Let's see how we go. but we had actually had two, didn't we? <laughs> Let's just pray. Father, you are a bountiful God who provides all of our needs and even some of our wants. We bring our tithes and offerings this morning that our money will aid in proclaiming the gospel message here in Gummeraka and the support of our overseas missionaries. Multiply our gifts, we pray. As we sing the next song, how be you? You like to go out for kids' church? Thank you, Fiona. Right. Yeah, not just yet. The next song is "Lord for the years Your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired um, us, cheered us on our way." It's really a prayer 
in song. So let's stand and sing. Peter's going to bring us a sermon which is the beginning of Advent, uh, the coming of the Messiah. And so we're going to read from John, the first chapter of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Though him, or through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet all who receive him to those who believe in his name he gave the right to become 
children of God. Children, or not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom was said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of the grace we have all received, one blessing after another, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Peter's going to come and expound this word to us. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. It's my pleasure to add my welcome to, uh, to Peter's this morning. When you look back over this past year, what do you see? What is the strongest or biggest or loudest picture or event that comes to mind? Now, let me give you a small time to think about your answer to that question, so I'll, I'll ask it again in a couple of minutes. In the light of uh, COVID-19, it's difficult to think about anything else that has been going on this year. But let me mention a few things. In January, do you remember what happened in January? It's a long time ago, isn't it? President-elect Biden took office. In March, China announced its 14th fifth-year plan, which, of course, we didn't hear anything of, or I can't remember anything about. In, the, in what happens in July, August? We had the Olympic Games. And then, of course, in September, we had the Paralympics. In September, Germany got a new councillor, chancellor, sorry. In October, we had the G20 summit in Italy. And in November, we had the climate change conference in Glasgow, which we didn't know whether Scott Morrison was going to go to or not, and all this about them, zero emissions and rah, 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 which was a bit of a, a fizzer from what I led to believe in terms of the whole conference. Do any of those events stand out to you? No. None of them stand out for me either, by the way. I only know these because I Googled it and found out something. At the moment, what stands out for me is the opening of the South Australian borders and the expected impact and the well, two already, I think, maybe three now, I don't know, two already cases that we've had already. But what about yourselves? What stands out for you in the year just gone by? <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, Absolutely, the road works down the main street. Uh, uh, and so they've d d Sorry? Granddaughter got engaged. Fantastic. It, in a big overall sense, do you have a positive, neutral, or negative um, response to 2021? A positive response? The main street is much, looking much better, and we're, we're just up to the other side with the paving, just past the pub there, so that's all good. But I, I think often the answer to that question depends on whether we have a positive personality. It depends on what we have read and heard, and then what we have actually dwelt on and, and allowed to sort of fester in our minds in terms of what we've read and uh, heard. Plus, it, uh, I'm not a negative personality, so I don't respond to a negative sense, but sometimes it seems that it's easier to focus and hone on the negative things than, than the positive. 
negative conversations tend to sort of carry on a bit longer than the positive conversations, don't they? This morning I want to look back further into our history to a time that encourages us to have a positive hope. But before I do that, let me read two verses from Psalm 33. The first is in verse 18, which says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hold in his steadfast love. Sorry, to those who hope in his steadfast love. And then verse 22, Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. In reading those verses, I want to say that the hope that we have needs to be based in our one true God as opposed to any sort of wishful thinking that we might might have. But let's go back to a dark time in the life of Israel. The worship of their God, the one true God, has waned and God's prophets were feeling in despair what's going on. But they have hope. And Isaiah writes this in chapter 9 and verse 2. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Now what on earth is Isaiah talking about? I can imagine the people and Isaiah just scratching their head thinking, what's, what's going on here? What's, what, what are you talking about, Isaiah? Four verses later, we get a bit of a, a hint. Isaiah writes this. In, this is on Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, that didn't really clear things up. But it did give the people something. A hope that simmered away and grew with each prophetic announcement. 600 years later, the Apostle John wrote this. And I'm going to read this out now, and I'm going to read that a little bit later on as well. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. After the death and life of Jesus, life and death, should I say, of Jesus, and with the coming of the Holy Spirit, we now know who Isaiah wrote about. We see Jesus in what Isaiah wrote. Jesus is the light, the child born and son given. At the time Isaiah wrote, I imagine many heads were scratched and wondering and questioning. But the Isaiah, but, but the light Isaiah was talking about, little be known to him was the light of Jesus. The prophet Isaiah could look around him and see much that would cause him to, to despair. The worship of God in the temple, etc., was in disarray. But God had given him a message and instead of just looking around him and all the things in dismay, he looked towards the future in hope. He may not have known exactly what it meant, but he recognized the hope in the message that he had been given. But what about us today? Jesus has already come, died, and risen. The light that Isaiah referred to has already come, and yet there is much we can see in our world that can lead us to despair. Is there still a future waiting for us that gives us hope? Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4, says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, 
Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. On Monday, just gone, Karen and I went to a funeral of a... Uh, she was the mother of, the, of my best man when we were married. At that funeral, and at dad's funeral, and at Mark's funeral in, on Monday week, we are reminded of the hope that we have. But I just don't want to just put our hope through the future as if it's something we are waiting for. It is more than that. It is also present. But I do want to highlight the future aspect of our hope. To put it bluntly, heaven is our home, our hope. When Jesus returns, God will create us a new home, a new heaven and a new earth where the effects of sin will be no more and we will be enjoying the presence of God in, in, in all the fullness of what that is. This is an important part of our hope. But where does this hope come from? If we go back to our John 1 passage, we are told who Jesus is. But let me read some selected verses. John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not made anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Verse 12. But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And then John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word who was in the beginning, and through him all things were made. In him there is life. Not just eating and drinking and breathing and living, but life. Without him we can live, but we don't have life. Besides creating everything, what else did the word do? Verse 14. He became flesh. He was born of the Virgin Mary and became a human being. He became one of us. Eventually, Jesus was crucified, but we'll, we'll leave that for each time. Because of who Jesus is, we have, can have confidence in what he did and what he promised. Have a look at verse 12 plenty of Bibles around I think. Have a look at verse 12. John chapter 1 and verse 12. What did Jesus promise in that verse? I'm expecting you to look it up. The right to become children of God. And if you have a look at verse 5, we have another promise. What is the promise there in verse 5? Okay, the light wins. <laughs> the light wins. Darkness does not overcome the light. Yeah? Look around you. What seems to be winning? It appears, or it can appear, that the darkness is winning. But is it winning? 
I'm sure that we've all felt like escaping from this world. Escape can be attractive, especially in the light of the future hope that we have. We can look at Revelation 21 and verse 4 and want to escape to that glorious future. But look at the life of Jesus. What did Jesus escape from? You say that louder, David. I saw that shake. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What did Jesus experience? Everything that we have experienced in terms of feelings, made in terms of the exact replication, replica in terms of we don't have Pharisees today, but Jesus escaped nothing. He didn't escape ridicule. He didn't escape being misunderstood. He didn't escape whippings and all sorts of things. He escaped nothing. There was much, as we as human beings look at Jesus' life, there was much there that we can look at and say, Stop the planet, I want to get off. But he didn't. Jesus went through suffering and went out, came out the other side. What was he? And the word I'm looking for starts with V. Victorious. And the victory can be seen in the fact that he died and rose from the dead. Death could not keep Jesus down. Death did not win the light overcomes the dark. Jesus had hope. Jesus would have known his Old Testament scriptures very well. In fact, it says that he lived to fulfill the Old Testament. The birth of Jesus took place in a way that was a fulfillment of the scriptures. You go, just go through Matthew chapter 1 and, and see how many times it says the scriptures are fulfilled. Jesus' ride into Jerusalem on a donkey was a fulfillment of scripture. Have a look at Matthew verse 20, or chapter 21. Even Jesus' cry on the cross where he cries out, I thirst, is a fulfillment of Scripture. I say all this to highlight the fact that Jesus didn't seek to escape but be victorious, even if there was suffering along the road to victory. And it's the same for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3 says this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The hope that, gives, that God gives us today is not escapism, it's given as a crowning victory, not just for the future, but for today as we live in a fallen world. As we live with hope in our fallen world, we can give something to the world that the world can't get from anywhere else. We can give the world hope. Not just a hope for the future for when Jesus returns, but a hope for today. We can give a hope that is based on the word of God who became flesh, lived, died, rise, rose to life, and offers life to everyone who believes. Let me ask you a question. Is there a possibility that justice Forgiveness, peace, mercy, grace, loving kindness, love, etc. may have a place in our world now. Yes, absolutely yes. How? Say that that. I heard someone said through us, who said that? Through us. As people come to faith in Jesus, they know justice because they know that all of their sins are paid for by the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus on the cross. In that, they also know forgiveness, mercy, grace, peace, 
etc., etc. The Lord's Prayer says this. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, you will be done. Where? On earth, as it is in heaven. When this becomes our prayer, we also become the vehicles of God's peace, of God's love, of God's justice to, to the world in which we live in. We have a message to give to the nations of our world and as we live in the hope of Jesus, we have the courage to do what's needed to take God's message to our world, our nation, our state, our neighbour. This message is the message of hope. Today, our lives can be filled with justice, mercy and compassion, etc. And our future will be filled with the glorious presence of God forever. That hope starts with faith in the once dead, now risen Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world and the light overcomes the darkness. Taking this message to our neighbours, friends and world in which we live in is a risky business. But hope gives us courage to take the necessary risk. As we go into this Christmas period of Advent, may we go with the hope of Jesus and may we be prepared to, sh to, to know this hope and share this hope with those around us. Hope is needed in our world and may that hope be the hope of Jesus as opposed to some nice 